Praise God. God bless you while you remain standing. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 16, a very familiar passage. And then I'm going to also read a couple of verses from 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. But first, beginning with Matthew chapter 16, verses that are so well known to all of us and uh, have somewhat to do with what I was just talking about. But uh, the Bible says this in verse number 17 of Matthew 16. And Jesus answered... And said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and then in second kings chapter 7 a passage that may seem to be unrelated the bible says in verse 1 then elisha said hear ye the word of the lord thus saith the lord tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king uh, leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. My subject today is very simply this, the gates of hell versus the windows of heaven. The gates of hell versus the windows of heaven. You may be seated today. Praise God. The enemy, according to what we read in the Word of God, has always tried to oppose and undermine whatever God is doing. He works incessantly, nonstop, to try to counter any of the work of God. And I must tell you today that his efforts cannot be trivialized. We don't make light of them. We have a formidable enemy. The Bible said, as a roaring lion, he roams about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible calls him our adversary. And so we do not trivialize his power, nor do we underestimate it, because it is considerable, and the enemy has formidable resources to draw from. The Bible even calls him the God of this world. Before Jesus inaugurated his ministry, he went into the wilderness where he went 40 days without any food. And there he was tempted and tested of the devil. He met the enemy on the proving ground. Amen. And there he was subjected to three major temptations. I, I don't believe that when the Bible tells us about those, that it was just those three things and nothing else. I believe those are really general categories in which the Lord was tempted in. And the third of them, the Bible says that Satan uh, told him, showed him all of the kingdoms of the earth and then said, all these will I give to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus did not dispute the fact that the devil was in a position to do so. 
He didn't say to him, they are not yours to give. He didn't argue that point. He just simply told him, you'll not, you'll not tempt the Lord your God. What the devil was trying to offer him was winning the world without Calvary. Going to the top of the world without having to go through the deep valley of death. Praise the Lord. And so that in itself represents the great power that the devil holds. We can certainly see in our world today that the nations of the world are in the grip of the enemy. None of them can be considered righteous countries. In the, even the United States of America is really no longer a Christian nation. It is not a nation that uh, really uh, it serves God in any way. And uh, it's statistically proven that less than half of Americans today even consider themselves churchgoers or Christians. And so America has become in itself a mission world, a mission field. America has become one of the chief exporters of evil and iniquity to all the world via all of the entertainment venues and, and in other ways. And so, you know, the point is that the devil is the god of this world and is always working to oppose the work of God and the kingdom of God which is in this world. And so I want you to consider this expression, the gates of hell today. And many of you have heard this many times before, but I want to reiterate it today, and especially for the benefit of those that may be watching and listening that aren't as familiar with it. Amen. But the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 16 that the Lord took his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now this church has heard me comment about this and several of us that have visited the country of Israel were taken on our tour to Caesarea Philippi which is on the north side of the country of Israel almost at the foot of Mount Hermon which is a uh, very high mountain that is constantly and always covered in snow and it's because of that melting snow and the uh, water uh, dripping down from it becomes the little rivulets that eventually form the River Jordan that gives life to that country and to that uh, fertile crescent, it's called, that valley that just grows just about anything because uh, uh, God has put into that ground uh, fertility and the land that flowed with milk and honey that had been promised to Abraham and his descendants. And so up at the north part of this country is this place called Caesarea Philippi. And so uh, when we went there, we saw uh, clear evidence that it had also been a center of idol worship and uh, paganism because there were the ruins of several temples side by side there in that place. And uh, so you can imagine that Jesus being God manifest in the flesh, that he bristled at the very uh, atmosphere that surrounded him of paganism and idol worship, which was a violation of the very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But he chose that place to ask the vital question of his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they gave different answers and then he personalized it because it is important that everybody personally know who Jesus is. But who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we come into the passage that we read today when Jesus said, you're blessed because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I tell you, you're Peter. And upon this rock, Peter means stone, but he wasn't talking about Peter being the rock. He was talking about the revelation that Peter had of who Jesus was. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And to our surprise, when we visited that location, there's a large opening there on the side of the mountain. Looks like a, a large cave opening. And uh, they told us that uh, in old days, back in ancient times, these pagan uh, religions would take human sacrifices up to the top of this hill and toss them down into the open mouth of that cave. And there was water down in there. And farther down there, there is a river, a stream that flows from there that joins others to become the River Jordan. And they would throw human sacrifices off into that open mouth. And uh, if blood appeared in the water farther down, it meant that the gods had rejected the sacrifice. But if no blood appeared, it would mean to them that the gods had accepted it. And to our surprise, guess what was the name of that large opening? Even back then, it was called the gates of hell. There's a, there's a sign right there uh, for the tourists to see uh, telling you that that's what that was called, the gates of hell. So it's no accident and no coincidence that Jesus took his disciples to this spot, to this location, to make this point. Now, he wasn't talking necessarily about that open cave being the gates of hell that shall not prevail against the church. We had never even heard of it till that day. And so it has never been a problem or a menace to me or any of you, that physical location. But I believe that the reason he took them there was because of everything that that represented, all those different uh, temples to pagan gods and idol worship that were there. So what Jesus was saying was everything that all of this represents that comes against the work of God will never prevail against this church. Amen. I'm glad to report that all those temples are just ruins today. They don't exist anymore. And that opening called the gates of hell I suppose they don't throw human sacrifices into it anymore. But I'll tell you this much. The church is still alive and well today 2,000 years later. Because the evil and corrupt system that all of that represented that has come against the church in these two millennium has still not succeeded in destroying the church that Jesus said he was going to establish. And I'm glad I'm a part of it today, aren't you? It's a church that's built on a firm foundation. And so Jesus used the expression, the gates of hell, not just because of that large opening and what all of that represented, but gates. A gate is both uh, an entrance and it is an exit. You can go in and you can come out. It signifies an opening through which Amen. Things are coming and going. It is also a barrier that can hold in or keep out. Amen. And, and the gates of hell are also representative of that system of darkness that holds people in bondage that they cannot get free of. Amen. But Jesus said these gates are not going to prevail. He came to set the captive free. He came to show us a way out. He came to provide us an alternative. He came to set you free, my friend. You don't have to stay a prisoner within the gates of hell. And yet, amen, this world is still heading pell-mell toward it. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go in their act. 2,000 years after Calvary, there's still multitudes of people that are plunging down into the gates of hell. They may not be being thrown off of that mountain, but spiritually, amen, they are plunging through the gates of hell into eternal destruction. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to be free, and if you want out, and if you want to be delivered, there is a way. There is an alternative. There is a path. There is a plan to set you free. 
In fact, I'm going to get a hold of, ahead of myself a little bit here today and tell you that Acts 2.38 is still the vehicle to set you free from the gates of hell. Repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, amen, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Before Jesus spoke about that wide gate and that broad way, he said, enter in at the straight gate. There is a straight gate. It's narrow. Amen. It's clearly defined. And you have to squeeze through it. But you can get through it. And that way leads to life. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise here today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. And so Jesus said, these gates shall not prevail. To prevail means to be superior in strength or to overcome. And Jesus said, no matter how strong those gates might seem, they will not prevail, they will not overcome this church. But it doesn't mean that they don't try. It doesn't mean that there isn't constant and relentless pressure. He just said they will not prevail. But it doesn't mean that they would not make the attempt. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. Everything around us is contaminated by the enemy. He has taken control of virtually every venue uh, that you are aware of in the world around us. And through every angle and every means available to him, he is bringing pressure against the church today. Y'all hearing me today? Praise the Lord. And so uh, we could talk about all of the institutions of this world. We know the governments are corrupt. They're corrupt from the top down, from the White House down through the state houses, down through the local governments. It is corrupt all the way. Even the Supreme Court of the land is corrupt today. The Supreme Court that has deigned to say, amen, that abortion is legal or that same-sex marriage is acceptable, going against the very fundamental laws of God. The Supreme Court is corrupted. The government is corrupted. Y'all hearing me today? Our educational system is corrupted. Our textbooks steer young minds away from God. And the farther they go in education, the more that they are uh, indoctrinated with humanistic uh, reasoning and uh, agnostic thinking or atheistic thinking. And uh, they take the scissors of reason to clip the wings of faith, and to rob from our children and young people any belief in a higher power and to doubt everything around them and to be cynical and skeptical and nothing is, there are no absolutes. Everything is relative and everything is subjective until they don't know what to believe, until they don't, they're not even sure what gender they are. Praise God. And so they talk about science, but science has aligned itself against the Word of God. And they scoff at the Word of God as though the things written in this book are not even possible. And then as new information comes in and new data comes in, they have to keep rewriting the textbooks. And little by little, they have to acknowledge, well, yeah, this is right. And yeah, that's so. Amen. Because the Word of God is still right. I said it's still right, and I believe my Bible from page one all the way to the last page. I believe it from the opening statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You believe that today? Is there anybody in the house this morning? I said, do you believe that today? God is still the creator, and I believe his word. I believe it through 
and through. But so-called science comes in opposition against the word of God and tries to scoff and belittle and make fun and ridicule our faith and what we stand on. Amen. But as new information comes in, the word of God still stands supreme today. We know that religion, amen, is aligned against the truth because everything that goes under the guise of religion is not right. It doesn't mean that it is correct and authentic. In fact, there are over 3,000 major religions in the world today, and some of them even claim origins in some of Scripture, amen, but they don't embrace all of it. You either embrace all of it or none of it. Because if you embrace just part of it, it's still false doctrine. And the enemy knows how to use false doctrine to deceive people who have a religious desire and inclination. You want to believe in God? Okay, I'll give you a God that is Conform to your image. I'll give you a God that suits your thinking. I'll give you a God that matches up to your reasoning and your evaluation of things. That's not how it works. We don't bring God to our level. We've got to rise to his level. We don't conform him to our image. We've got to conform to his image. He already took on as much of our image as he could when he robed himself in flesh and came and dwelt among us, but he lived a sinless life. I said he lived a sinless life. He was without sin. There was no guile found in his mouth. He showed us how to live. Bible said he was tempted in all points even as we are and yet without sin. I believe that with all my heart today. Jesus was not a sinner. He was not baptized for his sins. He was not crucified for his sins. He was crucified for my sins. He went to Calvary for my sins. He bore my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I am healed. Amen. He went as a stand-in for me. He went in as the perfect lamb. He was presented as the supreme uh, sacrifice without spot, without blemish, without any imperfection to show you there is a higher ideal. There is a better way to live. The devil's very persuasive. Very persuasive. Amen. Uh, the Bible tells us that whenever he rebelled against God that he succeeded in bringing down a third of heaven's angels with him. We don't even know how many that is. But I guarantee it's millions and millions and millions of them that are loose on this earth today. And these devils and spirits do not die. Can I tell you that the uh, demons that Jesus cast out during his ministry in Judea are still roaming the earth today. The devils that inhabited the demoniac at Gadara are somewhere in this world today tormenting somebody else. The Bible said that when the evil spirit has gone out of a man, they roam looking who else they might inhabit. Amen. And so those spirits are still around. And I guarantee you they have found their way into the highest levels of government and of entertainment and of fashion and of education and of so-called higher learning. They've found their way into influential positions all over this world to keep this uh, generation of people in bondage and in slavery spiritually, amen, to the powers of darkness. Oh, yeah, amen. And so you can't discount his ability to deceive. If he can deceive angels, he can deceive you. Don't kid yourself, you're not that smart. You might have been the brightest person in your class, but you're no match for the devil. He knows how to deceive. He's been around a long time and he has perfected his craft. From the time he started with Eve uh, in the garden and deceived her by showing 
uh, her something that was appealing and desirable to look at, amen, and began right there and still doing it today, bringing along everything that is enticing and appealing and, and is attractive in order to draw people away after himself. He is very powerful and he is very persuasive. And if you're not a praying person and if you don't read this Bible and if you don't listen to the word of God, you have no defense against him. Because even when Jesus met him on the battlefield of temptation, amen, as the devil tempted him, his response every time was, it is written. The word of God is the only weapon that you have against the devil, amen, to, to disarm him and his, uh, and his uh, uh, lies and half-truths that he tells. Because he's good at telling half-truths. He's good at questioning things that are right. He said to Eve, hath God said that if you eat of this fruit, you will die? Questioning what God had said. Amen. And he plants those questions in people's minds yet here today. Even to Jesus, he tried it by saying, if thou be the son of God. You know, he still tries to use that on us today. If you're a child of God, why are you still dealing with sickness? If you're a child of God, why are you having this financial need? If you're a child of God, why are you having this trouble and this problem in your family? If you're really a child of God, why are you having all this opposition and this trouble and this struggle? I'll tell you why. Because we're human beings in a world that is filled with pain and torment and sickness and disease and sin, but this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen. We're going to have trouble in this world. We're going to have opposition in this world. Our promises are not for this world as much as they are for the next one. Praise God. So he is very persuasive and he can deceive you if you'll let him use shiny things and attractive things and appealing things. And along the same lines, amen, he's able to harness uh, every new technology uh, and use it in order to uh, continue to advance his agenda. And uh, we're witnessing the advancement and the encroachment of technology in our lives and in our homes, in our society like never before. And uh, not to mention the fact that they become a vehicle to pipe in all kinds of corruption and decadence and filth into our minds and hearts, but also just the fact that they are so uh, neat and cool, uh, and fun to use until they occupy our time and they divert our minds and they keep us busy doing other things instead of focusing on sometimes the things that we need to focus on. Praise the Lord. Don't get too quiet on me now here this morning. But we're, we're living in a day where you know, if there's five idle minutes, everybody's got their phone in their hand. And, and they're checking their email or they're checking their uh, social media accounts and, uh, or they're checking the news or they're checking scores uh, of games and, uh, or they're trying to find out, you know, what, what's happening here and what's happening there. And, or they're listening to music. Folks got their earbuds in and they're, you know, they're mm, all day long. And so they never have any time for private thought or for quiet reflection or to think about their eternal destiny or to think about their spiritual condition. You all hearing me today? And so technology is not just a threat because of what it can introduce to you, but it's a threat just because it dominates and controls people's time. And then there's games and all sorts of stuff, things that people spend untold number of hours on. And, and there, we have a young generation now today that doesn't even sleep properly or eat properly because they sit uh, tied to those game machines playing by the untold hour. 
And while some of them might not be evil, and while some of them might be clean fun, the enemy knows how to just tie us all up until we don't think about God and we don't think about our soul and we don't think about eternity and we don't think about heaven and we don't think about hell. We stay distracted and diverted. Just hitting a little close to home. We've got church folks that can't hardly stay awake uh, on Sunday morning because they've been up half the night playing games. We've got adults in church that are Holy Ghost filled that are having a hard time function at, functioning at work or staying awake in traffic because they don't sleep right. Amen. And that, that's a problem for all of us if we'll let it. That's right. That's right. And so the enemy who is the God of this world and the prince of the power of the air. Amen. And, and I, don't, uh, I don't think that the internet is evil in and of itself. It's a tool. It's, a, it's an instrument that fulfills a function. In many cases in our society, a, a, a needed and valuable function. It's certainly made a lot of things easier. But it's also, amen, a avenue. It's also a pipeline. And it's only going to get bigger and more involved. And it's not growing like this. It's growing exponentially. Five years from now, we have no idea how technology is going to be impacting our life. And we have to be careful because the gates of hell is marching out things all the time. Amen. To cause us to be lost or to come against the church to destroy the church, to weaken the church. The gates of hell. Amen. New soldiers coming out. New weapons coming out. New resources coming out. New innovations coming out. Praise the Lord. The Bible speaks about mankind even way back in the early days of the Old Testament said man had sought out many inventions. Every new invention, every new innovation, the enemy knew how to take it and harness it and to manipulate it and control it to where it would be used against the people of God. We have to be on the lookout for that because the gates of hell are very active. Oh, that didn't work? Let's see how this works. Oh, that didn't have the effect that we wanted? Hey, man, how about this? Oh, the enemy knows that he has but a short time. And so he's doing everything in his power today. Is anybody hearing me in this house? And when you put it all together, we can talk about many other things. It can all be quite overwhelming to the child of God and to the church today until we wonder how in the world are we going to survive? How are we going to overcome? How are we going to be victorious? There's pressure everywhere. There's stress everywhere. The Bible said we're troubled on every side. Everywhere you look, amen, hell is throwing stuff at us. These demonic entities and, and innovations and, and inventions coming out of the gates of hell to attack the people of God. They don't care about the people of this world that have no desire to live for God. They're after you and they're after me. And when we pray, we come up against it. And when we try to worship, we come up against it. And when we come to church like this, we come up against it. And that's why I'm having to push my way through this message here today because the enemy doesn't want you to hear and the enemy doesn't want you to receive and the enemy doesn't want you to benefit from it. So we have to fight through these church services. We have to push our way through these church services. And we're going to do it whether you say amen or you don't say amen. Amen. But we need a body of believers that understands that hell has arrayed itself against us. It's out to destroy us. We better get some fight about us. We better get some resistance about us. Instead of just sitting there and biding your time till the service gets over with, bored and indifferent, if that's you, hell has already won. If that's you, hell has already succeeded. 
We need men and we need women and we need young people that will say, not here. Not here and not now. We will fight. We will resist. We'll not back down. Say, but we're powerless. We're just little old us and there's not much we can do. Maybe not, but we're a part of an entity that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. If you don't want it, amen, it can't win. If we won't let it, it can win. It will not prevail. It will not succeed. It will not overcome. It will not overwhelm. Amen. Even when we're pressed against a wall and it seems like we have no other recourse left, God is still able to charge us up and give us a new determination. Anybody feel that way here today? Anybody feel like fighting? Anybody feel like resisting? Anybody feel like opposing? The gates of hell. Amen. Now let's bring the other part of the equation into the story. And I read to you this passage from the Old Testament, seemingly unrelated to what I have been talking about so far, that we read about in the New Testament. But it was a very, very terrible time where the Syrians had come and had come in, uh, against the city of Samaria and they had besieged it. And they had besieged it until there was a great famine in the city to the point where an ass's head, uh, that's, that's a donkey's head, uh, to anybody who might wonder what we're talking about, sold for a large price of silver. Amen. Mmm. A good old tasty donkey head and dove's dung was being sold for food for a high price. I guess if you get hungry enough, you'll eat just about anything. Amen. And I don't want to make light of that today because it was a dire situation. I'll tell you how dire it got. It got so bad that two women got together and they decided to eat their infants. And they boiled the son of one of these women and they ate him. That's what your Bible tells you in chapter 6 of 2 Kings. And then the next day, and these women had the, had the gumption to come and bring this complaint to the king. To ask him to judge it. And, and this woman said the next day, when it came time to boil her son, she took him and hid him. And so, you know, that's not fair. And she wanted the king to judge in her favor. How can you get so calloused? How can you get so heartless that two women would be willing to speak openly to the king, to the authority of the fact that they had killed their baby and were wanting to kill another one? And wanting him to judge in the matter as though it was no big deal. Let me tell you something. When society reaches its bottom, it starts to devour its young. Can I tell you that we have long reached that point in America? No, they may not be boiling their babies to eat them. But the plague of abortion has become accepted and commonplace in our society all the way up. Amen. The different realms of government until even recently when they tried to pass a stricter law in Texas saying, amen, if, the, if there was a discernible uh, heartbeat, they could not abort that baby. And you have movie stars and you have important people and people in high position, amen, celebrities, so-called celebrities that are outraged about it and threatening never to visit Texas again as though that's going to bother the Texans. Amen. And uh, making a big stink. And now they have, 
lined up different judges to try to weigh in on the thing and try to reverse the whole thing as being unconstitutional. Can you imagine that it is constitutional to end an unborn infant's life? And now in some states, even all the way up to the time of birth. That's how low America has gotten. That's how low our society has sunk. You know what? We're living with it so much that we hardly even think about it any day. And yet tens of millions of babies' lives have been ended prematurely because of the scourge of abortion. Because when society reaches its lowest depth, it starts to devour and destroy its young as though it's nothing. Praise God, praise God. And, and you may not think of it that way when you go out for your hamburger this afternoon and everything looks normal around you, but we're living in a decadent society today when it looks like the gates of hell are winning on every side, when it looks like there is no recourse and there is no way out of this terrible predicament. And into this scenario steps a man of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And the man of God said, tomorrow, not next year, not 10 years from now, not a generation from now, but tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Let me tell you about God. It doesn't matter how bad things are. You're just a day or so away, my friend, from victory. A day or so away from deliverance. A day or less away from victory. A day or less away from relief, from reversal. It might be the worst of the worst and the lowest of the low, but God can still step in and say, by this time tomorrow, everything will have changed. And I'm here to tell you that even in America, amen, in 2021, September 12th, as bad as things are, and it looks like the devil is winning, and all we can say is we hope that Jesus comes soon. I'm here to tell you God is still able to step into the situation and say, by this time tomorrow, your problem can be changed. Your situation can be changed. Your need can be changed. Your dilemma can be changed. Your family situation can change. Now it might seem unbelievable, and it was unbelievable to a smart man, one of the king's counselors that the king leaned on, and this wise man, this smart man, this intellect, a man who was a counselor to the king said, Oh, haughtily and skeptically and cynically, if the Lord wants to make windows in heaven, might this thing be as though ha, 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 that's impossible. That's ludicrous. That's beyond our belief. Come on, go tell your silly fairy tale somewhere else. That's not going to work here. Do you understand how desperate our situation is? Do you see how big that army is? Do you see how bad, amen, circumstances are? And the man of God turned and said, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to be able to taste of it because of your cynicism, your skepticism. I'm here to tell you today, as bad as things are in America, as bad as things are in the world, amen, we're just a day away from revival. We're just a day away from relief. We're just a day away from deliverance. God can turn all of this around in a day's time. 
Why? Because they might scoff at the notion of the windows of heaven, but the hell might have its gates, but heaven still has its windows. I said hell might have its gates, but heaven still has its windows. And while the skeptics are saying it can't happen here, God's saying just hide and watch, Baba. And it happened just like that. And he didn't have to bring in a superior army. He used four leprous men. Four leprous men. Almost like adding insult to injury. Letting them know I can use the weakest instruments. I can use, amen, the most helpless to turn any situation around. You might feel weak and you might feel helpless, but God can still use you if you'll put you in the hands, if you'll put yourself in the hands of God. God still has windows in heaven. And just like with Samaria, amen, he supplied their need. Oh, yeah, he did. Served it up to them on silver platters. More food than they could even eat. Enough that they started sharing with other people because they had so much. They not only got food, they got garments, they got wealth, they got everything that they needed. Amen. In one day's time, God turned it around when the windows of heaven start pouring out, my friend. Oh, it's not meager. It's not skimpy. It's not just a little bit. It's not just a trickle. But he can pour it out. That's why the Lord said in the book of Malachi, amen, you've robbed me of tithe and offerings. And they said, how have we robbed you? And he said, because of you're robbing me of tithes and offerings. And he said, let me tell you what, amen, give, give. If you'll give, the Lord is able to pour out, huh? Pour out the windows of heaven. To where you won't even have room to receive all of the blessings that will come from it. And not only that, he said, I rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's a bonus. He doesn't just meet your need. He's able to rebuke the devourer for your sake. He's able to oppose the enemy for your sake. While he's blessing you financially, while he's blessing you materially, while he's blessing you, amen, in ways that you need to, for your everyday survival, he can also rebuke the devourer and say, get away, get away. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord today. I'm trying to hurry. Praise the Lord. The windows of heaven. The windows of heaven. You know, it happened just like the prophet said. And the next day when the news came that the enemy had abandoned their camp and there was more there than what they could even carry, uh, they, they stormed the gates. And guess who was holding the gate open? That smart man, that intellect, that skeptic, that highbrow, that cynic, they said, it ain't never happened here like that before. It's not possible for something like that to happen. If God was to wake, make windows in heaven, might this thing be? He's holding the gate open, and he got trampled to death. He saw it with his eyes, but he never did get to enjoy it. I hope we don't have just skeptics and cynics here today, but people who can say no matter how bad things are in America, or how bad things are in the world, God still has windows in heaven. He's still pouring out grace. Romans 5 and verse 20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is divine enablement. 
The Bible is saying no matter how bad things get, I'll give you enough grace that you'll be able to go through it. You'll be able to deal with it. You'll be able to handle it. The windows of heaven are still pouring out peace. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world, in the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How can you all be so happy? How can you all still shout? How can you all still sing? Are you in denial? No, we're not in denial. We're in acceptance of the fact that we have a God that is superior to all of our troubles and all of our problems and all of our trials. Windows of heaven still pouring out power. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Praise the Lord. Power after the Holy Ghost. I just feel so weak. I just, feel, I just don't think I can make it, Pastor. Pray for me for my strength in the Lord that I'll be able to survive. You know what you need? You need a good praying through of the Holy Ghost. Because when you get a good praying through of the Holy Ghost, you'll get a whole new dose of power. And let me tell you how it happened. The Bible said, amen, they were all in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from, a sound from, a sound from, Oh, if the Lord was to make windows in heaven, might this thing be? There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And they were all, they were all, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Can I tell you he's still pouring out the Holy Ghost today? And I tell you, the windows of heaven are still pouring out power to the weak and to the needy today. We heard the reading from the book of Isaiah earlier in this service. Amen. Where it said even the young men will faint and they'll fall. Amen. They'll stumble. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. Praise the Lord. Has not all, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 said, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That means righteous living, godly living. Amen. It was 2021. Pastor, you can't expect us to live holy and righteous nowadays. You know, times have changed and and uh, situations have changed. And, and now this is, this is what everybody's doing. Right. Well, that's what the gates of hell are doing. But God's people are receiving strength and help from above. From the windows of heaven pouring out upon us. Amen. All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, listen to this, exceeding great, exceeding great and precious promises. Doesn't matter what you're facing, there's a promise that exceeds that. Doesn't matter what your difficulty is, there's a promise that exceeds that. Doesn't matter what your challenge is, there's a promise that exceeds that. Doesn't matter what, your, what valley you're going through, there's a promise that's greater than that valley exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust you can live for God in 2021 you can be saved in 2021 you can make heaven your home in 2021 I don't care what the gates of hell are throwing at us the windows of heaven are pouring out more power and ability and grace Last but not least, last but not least, him in Acts 3 and verse 19, the apostles spoke about the times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. 
Have you ever come to church feeling like you was on your last leg? I don't know what that means, last leg. I've only got two of them. Amen. And I use both of them to walk. And so, you know, but anyhow, you just come dragging in. And, and the thought in your mind is, I wish I had just stayed home tonight. I don't feel like singing. I don't feel like worshiping. And they're going to try to get me to, to lift my hands and clap my hands. And they're going to be yelling and screaming at me. And I don't feel like doing all that. I'm tired. I'm cranky. I'm irritable. I'm mad. I'm disgusted. Amen. And I just want to go home and get in the bed. No point in you all getting so quiet right here because I know every last one of you are guilty of it. How do I know that? Because I know I is too. I've felt that way sometimes too. I'd have been better off to have stayed at home. Amen. Kick back in the recliner with a large glass of iced tea or a big cup of coffee. Amen. No Miller time. No, no, no. None of that stuff. You don't need none of that. Praise the Lord. Why would you resort to that when the Lord made coffee? You know, the, whole, <laughs> the Old Testament, the Bible said man did eat angels' food, talking about manna. Well, <clears throat> I think that somewhere along the way he shared heaven's brew with us. Amen. I still maintain that the, that the smell that hits your nose, the aroma that hits your nose when you walk into a Starbucks or a similar coffee shop, that's the smell of the New Jerusalem. <laughs> Amen. This is, woo, my knees get weak. I'm being ridiculous, I know, but you know what I'm saying. You're tired. You fought traffic boss fussed at you, blamed you for things you weren't even guilty of. Somebody else, hey amen, uh, did something wrong and you got the blame. <clears throat> and plus you got this ache in your side and, or you got a headache and, and you know how it is. You walk in the church, oh man, I don't know if I can take this. And then, then that preacher's going to get up and he's going to scream and holler too. Tell me everything I'm doing wrong. And I just need a little patting and a little, you know, comforting. Sometimes that's the way it is. But then there's those times you came in. The, it might be just a Wednesday night church. Brother Jerry, everybody about tired and eyes at half mast, eyelids at half mast. Some surrender altogether. <laughs> Amen. And then they start singing a song, and the next thing you know, the Spirit gets to moving. Holy Ghost gets to moving through the house. Next thing you know, hands are going up. Next thing you know, tears are running down people's faces. Next thing you know, people are talking in tongues. Next thing you know, people are leaping for joy. Next thing you know, people are shouting hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where did that come from? The windows of heaven. Times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. It may not be that way every time you come to church, but you never know when it's going to be. And you don't want to hear about it secondhand. You want to be there if at all possible so that you can get under that spout where the glory comes out. And let the Holy Ghost just wash over your soul and the Bible said we are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. The outward man perishes, the Bible said, but the inward man is renewed day by day. You know, there's something about this God that we serve. He made us. He knows how we, how we function. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what makes us tick. And he is able... Some way, somehow, supernaturally, in ways that a power drink won't do, in ways that even a cup of coffee won't do, 
in ways that even an eight-hour night of sleep won't do. He is able to come down and restore and refresh your soul, and you can even leave feeling better in your body. Because when you are down and pressed above measure, you can hardly lift your eyes up and you, can, you can't get your hands up. You're so tired, you're so weary, you're so bummed out, you're so discouraged, you're so despondent because the gates of hell are pressing in on you from every direction. The devil is beating you up, talking in your ear, harassing you, stressing you out. There's problems, there's bills, there's infirmities, there's kids, there's spouses, there's bosses, there's everything. And you finally say, I can't take it anymore of that all I can take. The windows of heaven start pouring out. And suddenly you're able to go again. Suddenly you're able to go again. Can we stand our feet today? Praise God, praise God. Can you lift your hands and worship him as they come? Get ready to sing. Come on, worship the Lord. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I don't want you to pay any attention to the activity behind me right now. For a few moments, I want you to listen to me. And what the Bible says, and I'm going to read this in closing. Amen. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 33, who shall lay anything to... Well, let's back up a verse. Verse 31 Two verses. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely, everybody say freely, give us all things. He wants you to make it. He wants you to to survive. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution what about famine, nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, including fallen angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, the gates of hell are raging. But they're not going to prevail because the windows of heaven just keep pouring out. Just keep pouring out. Can you lift your hands and receive it today as they begin to sing?